We've covered a wide range of early Christian beliefs and practices in our lectures up to this point. We've seen that there was a remarkable diversity among the Christian groups that we know of from the second and third centuries. For example, the Ebionites, the Marcionites, the Gnostics, the Proto-Orthodox. We can see these differences in a number of different areas of theological reflection. One area to see it in, see it in is especially in the area of Christology. The Ebionites thought that Christ was a human being, a righteous man, more righteous than anyone else, a good Jewish man who followed the Jewish law, and as a result of being more righteous than anyone else, was chosen by God, adopted by God at his baptism in order to be the Son of God. This stood in sharp contrast with the view of the Marcionites. Whereas the Ebionites thought that Jesus was a righteous man, the Marcionites thought that Jesus was God, completely God, so much God that he wasn't human at all, that Jesus only seemed to be human. And so they had a docetic Christology rather than the adoptionistic Christology of the Ebionites. Most Gnostics had a different point of view. Gnostics thought that Jesus was a man, but Christ was a God a divine eon who came from above and came into Jesus at his baptism, empowering him for his ministry, allowing him to do miracles, to deliver his fantastic teachings, but then leaving Jesus prior to his death so that on his cross Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you left me behind? Because the divine eon had left Jesus prior to his death. This then would be a separationist kind of Christology, one that separated the man Jesus from the divine Christ. This is different then from the Ebionite adoptionism and the Marcionite docetism. But there was also a proto-Orthodox view, which denied what each of the other parties had said, while affirming some aspects of what each party had said. The proto-Orthodox agreed with the Ebionites that Jesus was a man, but they disagreed when the Ebionites said that Jesus was not God, because for the proto-Orthodox, Jesus was God. And so they agreed with the Marcionites that Jesus was God, but they disagreed when the Marcionites said that he was not a man. They agreed with the Gnostics that there was Jesus and Christ, but they disagreed when they said that they were two different beings. For the Proto-Orthodox, there was one person, Jesus Christ, who was both God and man. The Proto-Orthodox Christology emerged to some extent in response to the various groups that they were attacking. These various groups with their various Christologies also had different views of God, different views of the world, different views of who human beings were, different views of most major theological issues. What is striking is that each of these groups had authoritative books that they claimed represented the views of Jesus and the apostles, books that they could use in support of their own perspectives. It's not just that the Proto-Orthodox had scriptures that supported their views. All of these groups had scriptures that could support each of their different views. Strikingly, these various groups could use books that eventually made it into the New Testament canon. There's a very interesting passage from the uh, Proto-Orthodox heresiologist Irenaeus, writing around the year 180 in his five books against the heresies that we've referred to earlier in this course. In this interesting passage, Irenaeus points out that various heretical groups used one or the, or the other of the Gospels that made it into the New Testament. The Ebionites, he says, used the Gospel of Matthew. Why? Well, because Matthew is the most Jewish of the Gospels and the Ebionites are Jewish Christians. Those who separated the Jesus from the Christ, he says, used the Gospel of Mark which makes sense because, as I've pointed out, in Mark's gospel, the Spirit comes into Jesus at his baptism, and then Jesus cries out, why have you forsaken me at the end, showing a possibly a separationist view. According to Irenaeus, those who were Marcionite used the gospel of Luke, the most Gentile of our gospels, in their opinion. Moreover, those who were followers of Valentinus used the gospel of John, because this in endorsed a kind of understanding of Jesus as one who's a divine person who comes down to reveal the truth that can set you free. Each of these four groups, says Irenaeus, used one of the four Gospels, and where they went wrong, he said, is in choosing just one of the Gospels instead of having all four. 
Irenaeus, an advocate of proto-orthodoxy, maintained that there were four Gospels and that we needed all four to have a complete understanding of who Jesus was. We know that there were other groups that in fact had additional Gospels. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Truth, the Gospel of Philip, and others. Some groups had more than one other Gospel. Some groups probably had many Gospels at their disposal to endorse their views. It's striking that despite the fact there was such a range of Christian belief, so many different groups advocating so many different theologies with so many different kinds of scriptures, that there was, in the end, only one group that emerged as victorious. There was one group that ended up winning the struggle to acquire converts and to establish the true nature of Christianity. This victorious group shaped for all time what Christians would believe and they determined for all time which scriptures would be accepted as canonical. How, though, did they do it? How did this one group establish itself as dominant and virtually eliminate all traces of both its opponents and the various scriptures that they revered? This is the question we'll be dealing with in the present lecture. The traditional answer comes to us from Eusebius the 4th century father of church history whom we've met before. As we've seen, Eusebius was one of the most important authors of Christian antiquity. He was a highly, uh, highly educated and aristocratic Christian who was well connected politically and well situated in the theological di disputes of his day. Most significantly for the subsequent history of early Christianity is that he wrote the first account of the course of the Christian religion from the days of Jesus down to his own time, early fourth century. Eusebius's ten-volume ecclesiastical history, as it's called, the ten-volume church history, was one of the most important writings to come down to us from antiquity. It's the source of much of our information about early Christianity. Eusebius's book discusses numerous topics, the spread of Christianity, the rise of important Christian churches in significant locations, the opposition to Christianity by Jewish authorities early on, internal Christian conflicts, heresy and orthodoxy, the persecution of Christians by governmental officials. Also, it discusses significant Christian leaders and writers. It's to Eusebius that we owe our knowledge of numerous Christian writings that otherwise we don't have. He quotes many uh, books that were available to him as sources, uh, and when he quotes them, then we have them. Uh, in most cases, we don't have manuscripts of these other books. And so it's to Eusebius that we owe much of our knowledge of what was written by Christians during the first three centuries. And it's to Eusebius that we owe what has become the classical understanding of the relationship between the various diverse Christian groups, or, as Eusebius would put it, the relationship between orthodoxy and heresy. According to Eusebius's view, which became the standard view throughout the Middle Ages down to the modern period, according to Eusebius's view, orthodoxy is and always has been the teaching of the main Christian churches. Orthodoxy is and always has been the teaching of the main Christian churches. Eusebius understood that what the theological doctrines were that were espoused by the majority of Christians, these theological doctrines were ones that were actually taught by Jesus himself to his apostles. His apostles then wrote them down and handed them down orally, and they were the majority view throughout history. Heresy in this view is always a corruption of this truth that was passed on by Jesus to his apostles. Heresy is a corruption of the truth spawned in almost every case by a malevolent apostate from the truth. There's always an individual who comes along who decides to pervert or corrupt the truth. He acquires a small, if occasionally pestiferous, following who become then a group of heretics. Heresy, in Eusebius' understanding, is always necessarily, by definition, a late, derivative, corrupt, minority view. A late, derivative, corrupt, 
minority view. That's what heresy is. Orthodoxy is the original truth that was held by the majority of churches at all time. Orthodoxy for Eusebius involves certain great truths that were always espoused by, by Christians. That there's only one God who's the creator of this world. That Jesus is his son. And that Jesus is both God and human. That Jesus died for the sins of the world and was physically raised from the dead. That there is also a Holy Spirit who is with God and who is God, just as Jesus is. A Holy Spirit that, with Jesus, forms with God the Father a trinity. These views, according to Eusebius, are taught by the books that were truly written by Jesus' own apostles. Heresies denied or corrupted one or another of these views. This classical view of the relationship of orthodoxy and heresy held the field among Christian thinkers for 16 centuries. Of course, it's still held by many people today. Ultimately, though, it goes back to Eusebius. A major shift in thinking came only in modern times with the discovery of other early Christian writings and a critical appraisal of the biases that were at work in Eusebius' account. The bombshell was dropped in 1934 by a prominent German scholar named Walter Bauer in a groundbreaking book that was entitled Orthodoxy and Heresy in Earliest Christianity. This was arguably the most important book written on early Christianity in modern times, Bauer's book on orthodoxy and heresy. Bauer maintained that Eusebius had not given an objective account of the relationship of early Christian groups, but that Eusebius had rewritten the history of Christian internal conflicts so as to validate the victory of the Orthodox party that he himself represented. Rather than being the original view that had always been shared by the majority of Christians, according to Bauer, what later came to be known as Orthodoxy was originally just one of the numerous forms of Christianity in the early centuries. It was the one form of Christianity that eventually ended up acquiring the majority of converts over time. Once it had done that, and once it had wiped out the opposition, then it rewrote the history of the conflict to make it, a, make it appear that it had always been the majority view. Writings that supported other views, for example, writings by Ebionites and by Marcionites and by Gnostics, were either systematically destroyed or else simply not copied so that they didn't survive into the Middle Ages down to today, so that we didn't suspect that, in fact, there were large groups of other people who had other views. All we had was the Orthodox view by Eusebius and those like him who said that their view had always been the view of the majority of the Christian churches. But as it turns out, even though this is, according to Bauer, this is how, uh, how it happened, that orthodoxy emerged as victorious, traces of the earlier conflict managed to survive. Bauer's book proceeds by going region by region through the early church, geographical region by geographical region, examining these surviving traces and showing that virtually everywhere we look, for example, Egypt, Syria, Asia Minor, in virtually every region that we know there were, uh, in which we know there were early Christians, the earliest attested form of Christianity are, in fact, non-Orthodox. The Egyptian churches, for example, according to Bauer, were largely Gnostic. Asia Minor was largely populated by Marcionite churches in the second century, and so forth and so on. There were, of course, according to Bauer, pockets of believers who held the views that later became dominant. These would be people that I've been calling proto-Orthodox. There were proto-Orthodox Christians scattered throughout the empire, of course. But these were not the majority everywhere, the way Eusebius makes out that they were. 
According to Bauer, these proto-Orthodox, though, were the majority in the city of Rome, as it happens. They were the majority in the city of Rome, and that ends up being significant. This happened to be the form of Christianity in the capital of the empire. As a church in the capital of the empire, it had certain advantages, and it took it made full use of these advantages that it had. This church in Rome happened to be a fairly large church as opposed to other places. Uh, of course, Rome was larger than any other city, and so the number of Christians uh, was larger than it was in other places. Moreover, Rome, as the capital, had large resources, vast resources that were available to the people who, who were there, and the administrative skills that were found throughout the city that helped it run the empire trickled down into the church as those who were uh, in the upper classes converted. The church in Rome eventually ended up asserting its influence on churches in surrounding areas and then throughout the world, according to Bauer. The church in Rome acquired more converts than others because it used its vast resources and its administrative skills in order to influence other churches. We have evidence that, in fact, this happened. One piece of evidence that uh, Bauer points to is one of the earliest writings we have from outside of the New Testament. In fact, this may be the earliest writing from outside the New Testament. It's commonly known as the letter of First Clement. It's written, First Clement is written by the church in Rome to another church, the church in Corinth. It's a rather long letter. The main point of the letter is to deal with a problem that had arisen not in the church in Rome, but in this other church in Corinth. What had happened is there had been some kind of coup in the upper uh, regions of the church in Corinth. There had been a coup in which the presbyters, the uh, leaders of the church, had been kicked out and some other people had come in to take over the leadership of the church. The Christians in Rome were incensed at what had happened and they write this letter in order to reverse the situation. It's in order to get the Christians in Corinth to reinstate the presbyters from their church. I'll quote parts of this letter from chapter 47. It is disgraceful, says the Roman Christians, exceedingly disgraceful and unworthy of your Christian upbringing to have it reported that because of one or two individuals, the solid and ancient Corinthian church is in revolt against its presbyters. So they've heard about this uh, coup and they're upset about it. They say in this letter that this was completely inappropriate. It's inappropriate because the presbyters of this church had been appointed by those who had been appointed by apostles who had been appointed by Jesus who had come from God. In other words, this letter develops a, an understanding that later became known as the doctrine of apostolic succession. God sends Jesus, Jesus has his apostles, the apostles point the bishops over the churches, the bishops appoint their own successors, and so if you get rid of one of the successors, you're opposing then their predecessors who were apostles, who were from Jesus, who was from God, by getting rid of these presbyters, in fact, you're opposing God. This letter of First Clement then is Trying to, uh, trying to change the situation in Corinth so that it will revert to a situation that the Roman church prefers. The Roman church clearly liked the other presbyters better and wanted these other presbyters to be in control. Bauer argues that what's going on then in First Clement is that Rome, unsolicited, has tried to intervene in the internal affairs of another church. And it appears from subsequent history that they were successful in doing so. This is the kind of thing that Rome started doing, and in fact, Rome became very good at. Rome was able to assert itself over other churches. It could do this in a number of ways. It could write letters like this, trying to urge people to change the way they're acting. Uh, Rome could use the resources available to them. They had uh, a lot of money available. They could give donations to other churches if the churches would elect so-and-so to be their bishop. They could manumit slaves with this money, set slaves free. Well, then who, which church are the, are the slaves going to go to? Are they going to go to the Marcionite church someplace, or are they going to go to the church that the Roman church says they should go to? Well, according to Bauer, manumission of slaves allowed for, uh, for increase of converts within the churches that agreed with the Roman point of view. 
Rome began asserting its influence at the end of the first century in the letter of First Clement. It continued to assert its influence until Roman Christianity started spreading throughout the Roman Empire. Eventually, of course, the Roman Emperor converts to Christianity, and that changes everything. Christianity had been growing bit by bit over the years, but when the Roman Emperor converted, then there was an explosion in the spread of Christianity. What kind of Christianity will the Roman Emperor convert to? He'll convert to a Roman form of Christianity. Eventually, it's the Roman Church that has control of the Church throughout the world. The Roman Church, the Roman Catholic Church, determines the course of future Christianity. Well, this is a uh, this is quite different from what you get in Eusebius. Uh, in Eusebius' understanding, orthodoxy started out as one big thing that everybody subscribed to, beginning with Jesus and his apostles. Heresies were little offshoots that came off of that occasionally. According to Bauer's understanding, Christianity didn't start out as one big thing. It started out as a bunch of little things in different parts of the world, Different parts, have, different parts, geographical regions having different forms of Christianity, only one of which ended up emerging as uh, victorious. It declared itself orthodox, and then it rewrote the history of the engagement. Many years have passed since Bauer's breakthrough in 1934, and I should say that uh, no one, to my knowledge, subscribes to his views wholesale. Yet nonetheless, his basic understanding of the relationship of what we call orthodoxy and heresy, continues to be enormously influential. In part, that's because we've made additional discoveries since his day, most significantly the Nag Hammadi Library, that appear to support his perspective. Even in Nag Hammadi, there's a range of beliefs represented in the Nag Hammadi Library. There's a lot of variety there. There's no, there's no monolith even there. We just happened to discover this library. This was not a form of Christianity or forms of Christianity that were preserved for us by Orthodox writers. These are forms of Christianity that we just happened to find. And as it turns out, what we happened to find support Bauer's view that there was a wide range of Christian belief. Early Christianity appears to most scholars today to have been widely diverse, not basically monolithic the way Eusebius would have had us believe. This, in fact, can be seen from our earliest sources that weren't even dealt with by Bauer. Bauer begins to study with the second century. If you go back even into the first century, you're struck by the amazing diversity of Christianity. Just think about the letters of the Apostle Paul. Paul writes letters to Christian churches that he himself founded, and in virtually every letter, he has to oppose people who are taking views that he finds offensive. He writes his letter to the Galatians to attack people who think that to be Christian you have to first become Jewish. He writes his, letter to the Corinthians, his letters to the Corinthians in order to argue that people don't already have spiritual salvation, that full salvation won't come until the second coming of Jesus. There are writings in Paul's names to the Ephesians, named to the Ephesians, to the Colossians, to the second Thessalonians. Letters in his name uh, that uh, to uh, First and Second Timothy and to Titus, the pastoral epistles, all opposing different forms of heresy, false teaching. Later on, the letter of Third Corinthians and still other pseudepigrapha. Everywhere Paul turned, he had enemies. His enemies thought that they were right and that Paul was wrong. We only have Paul's side of the argument. What if we had all of the sides of the argument? Remember the Ebionites. They thought that Paul was the arch-heretic. And what about the churches Paul didn't, found, didn't found? What points of view did they have? Well, we've become increasingly aware of other forms of Christianity not dealt extensively uh, with by Bauer, including various groups of Gnostics and Jewish Christians that Bauer simply didn't know about. Moreover, and perhaps this is the most significant point in this discussion for the purposes of this course, each of these different groups appears to have had its own literature, books allegedly written by apostles of Jesus, authorizing the theological views of their group. As Bauer himself recognized, the production and dissemination of literature was extremely important in the struggles 
between these various Christian groups. Christianity, unlike other religions in the world, was a literary religion. It's not that Christians could read and write more than other people in the world. In fact, Christians probably uh, tended to be more from the lower classes, probably could read and write less. Nonetheless, Christianity as a religion, for reasons that we'll be examining in the next few lectures, was in fact more literary than other religions, which simply didn't have religious texts as part of their, part of their religious practices. Christians did, though, and they used literature extensively, especially in these debates of heresy and orthodoxy. Literature was important in these struggles for five major reasons, or in five different ways. First, Christians on all sides wrote tractates supporting their own perspectives and attacking the perspectives of others. That's one way they used literature in these disputes between heresy and orthodoxy, the disputes among the various Christian groups. We've seen this already uh, in the heresiologists, heresy hunters like Irenaeus and Tertullian, who write lengthy treatises against the Gnostics, against Marcion, against others. We also have seen it, though, from the other side. Luckily preserved from us, from Nag Hammadi, is the Coptic Apocalypse of Peter, which, as uh, with another book uh, found at Nag Hammadi, the second treatise of the great Seth, attacks proto-Orthodox Christians for being heretics. Groups on all sides are using literature in order to attack the perspectives of others. That's one way literature is important in these struggles. Two, Christians use letters to various churches in order to urge them to ignore and remove teachers who taught beliefs and practices contrary to those thought to be true. Not just arguing against points of view and trying to convince people. There are a number of letters that we have that simply tell their readers to get rid of the false teachers. This happens already in the New Testament period. The pastoral epistles of 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, allegedly written by Paul to two of his pastor companions, tells them to get rid of false teachers. He doesn't argue with them. He doesn't say why they're wrong. He says simply get rid of them. Same thing in the letters of Ignatius of Antioch writing after the New Testament period in the early 2nd century, writing to different churches, telling them, get rid of the false teachers. It's simply understood that those who don't agree with Ignatius are false teachers and are to be gotten rid of. Three, some Christians, as we have seen throughout this course, forged documents in the names of Jesus' apostles in order to support their own points of view. This is a third way that Christians are using literature, by forging apostolic documents. So somebody writes a gospel and says that it's Peter who's writing the gospel, even though it wasn't. Somebody writes a gospel and says that it's Thomas who's writing the gospel, even though it wasn't. Somebody claims to be Paul and writes the letter of 1 Timothy, which makes it into the canon of Scripture. Someone else writes a letter claiming to be, claiming to be Paul, it's called 3 Corinthians, and it doesn't get into the canon of Scripture. Christians are forging documents in the names of apostles. Some of them become scriptural, others of them do not, in order to support their points of view. This is a third way that Christians are using literature in these conflicts. Four, some Christians who are copying the texts of earlier writers, copying them by hand, since they didn't have Xerox machines yet, they didn't have movable type, they had to copy their books by hand. Sometimes when they copied these books by hand, they changed the text that they copied in order to make the text appear to be more orthodox than they originally were. This happened even with the text that made it into the canon. I'm going to be devoting an entire lecture to this interesting question of scribes changing their texts in order to, to make them say what they wanted them to mean. I'll be uh, devoting a lecture to that later. Uh, so that's a fourth way Christians are using literature. And fifth, Christians of all sorts begin to compile lists of books that they accept as canonical authorities and exclude other books as heretical forgeries. In other words, Christians are using literature by compiling canons of sacred texts. Only one canon ends up surviving. Those are the five ways that Christians use literature in their struggle, uh, struggles of heresy and orthodoxy. In conclusion, 
we can say that the group that won these battles ended up deciding which books would be included in the scriptures and which uh, would be left outside, either as unworthy of canonical status or as flat-out heretical forgeries. How, though, can we be certain that they got it right? How can we be certain that the decisions about what to include in the canon based on who wrote these books, that they were apostolic authorities, how can we be certain that these decisions were right? For example, how can we know that the Gospel of Thomas was a forgery in Thomas's name, but that the Gospel of John actually was written by the son of Zebedee? And how did the process of forming this orthodox canon actually take place? Who decided which books should be included? On what grounds and when? These will be some of the questions we'll be addressing in the following lectures.